Martina, thank you very much for joining me. So let's just start back at the beginning for a minute. You were named, I understand, after Martina Navratilova. So was tennis always going to be a big part of your life? Oh, yes. Uh, that was determined already uh, before I was born with the name, you know, coming from Martina Navratilova, which was a great, you know, kind of freedom, symbol of freedom back in Czechoslovakia. She was more than just a tennis player. She was a living legend. And, and my mother was a former professional herself so that goes with it and she taught me to play at the age of two as soon as pretty much I started walking. <laughs> Here your mum coached you didn't she for most of your life how much of an influence was she in helping you to get to where you what you achieved? Oh well, thanks to her I was where I was and uh, we were a great team and uh, I would have never gone that, that far without her I mean already like I said at young age uh, she taught me pretty much everything also doing a lot of different sports it wasn't just Tennis was priority, but I started skiing uh, at three, you know, swimming and all these other sports, which had hand and eye coordination. <laughs> then you had to choose. So tennis, Wimbledon, we're here this year. I can't help but talk about it. You broke so many records in all of your tennis career, being the youngest ever to do everything. You won Wimbledon age 16. I think you'd won the doubles previously, but did you appreciate at that young age how, how, much, how significant it was to have done what you did? I appreciate it probably a lot more now because you don't really have that much time to celebrate when you're 16. I mean, yeah, I was like looking forward to the uh, to the dinner, you know, where it used to be the dance and everything. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to dance. <laughs> but um, at that time, you know, the next tournament was already coming up. You prepare yourself for the um, season in the U.S. and then the U.S. Open. So at that real moment, um, you, you don't really have much time. You, you are kind of in this tunnel vision. and. You just continue and you, you, ta you try to suck in the moment. Of course, when you're on center court, you hold up the plate and you show the trophy and everybody is uh, applauding. But um, at the end of the day, it just keeps going because sport is so fast living. And so you came so close to, to achieving the career, well, the Grand Slam, I suppose. You reached the French final. How much of a goal was that of yours at the time to try and accomplish? Well, it was kind of special because um, when I played the French Open finals, I came back of uh, surgery. So for me, like being in the finals, it was almost like already a win at that time. And probably, who knows, if I had won the French Open, uh, then I probably wouldn't win Wimbledon because I would have been just too tired and worn out and mentally. Uh, so like this, I was really hungry to, to win Wimbledon and, and go on and win the US Open as well. So uh, who knows? I mean, back then, like I wish I could replay a couple of those uh, French Open finals today, but that, that's back then and, you know, that's what it's today. Yeah, that's what happened. That's an interesting point, though. Do you think some of the slams are quite almost too close together in the calendar to give you enough time to recover and get ready again for the next? Well, I heard Wimbledon is talking about actually moving Wimbledon one week later, and I think that would be great for players who are actually, you know, able to win the Grand Slam. So it gives you a little bit this one week of, of a breather that you could actually maybe, you know, have a week off and, and play one preparing tournament on grass and, and then go into Wimbledon. Because for me, I always try to like figure out, should I play on grass or just should I take time off and, and relax and go mentally fresh into Wimbledon? And I think this would be a great opportunity to move it a week, so it gives you a bit more time to r relax. You're right, like we've seen perfect example, Kim Kleister this year sacrificed the clay court season to really try and you dominate at Wimbledon and, and sadly got knocked out yesterday but it means some players are having to risk you know almost avoiding the clay court season if they want to have the success at Wimbledon. Well it depends on the type of a player as well I think it's maybe more on the women, uh, men's side and on the women's because uh, usually the women's top players they, they're pretty good on all surfaces I mean they're dangerous they're champions so it's probably a little bit different on our uh, on our side but um, in general, you, you just get mentally like so drained out after a Grand Slam. So it's not even probably sometimes physically, but mentally you're like, okay, it's done and over, and you have to recharge your batteries. And it just sometimes it takes more time. But we also saw it just Wimbledon like Nadal, you know, it just as well it played so well, um, you know, winning his uh, seventh title at Roland Garros. But it was just too much to, in a short time, like coming back here and being, you know, hundred percent. I wanted to talk to you about that interesting point you've touched on. You had a couple of shock early losses from the slam after you'd won. We've obviously seen a couple this year, Nadal, Venus. You know, that mental 
attitude you have to get into to win a slam, you were also known for your mental toughness. How much can you relate to what Rafa's gone through this year at Wimbledon? Well, I do in a way, yeah. I, I had a couple of first round losses here. I mean, for sometimes for different reasons. I'm not, <laughs> not sure if uh, it was the same uh, with Rafa, but um, yeah, you just like I had this finals um, in 99 and then, okay, you, you were, I was just mentally out there. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. And it was the first time I also played by my mom, so it was kind of special too. I mean, like, crazy if I think back, but that's um, sometimes that's human, be being human, and that's, um, yeah, it happened in Wimbledon. Because you weren't just a singles player, you won so many doubles Grand Slam titles too. And interesting in the game today, not everyone plays singles and doubles at a high level, some of them do. We obviously see the Williams sisters, but how important was it for you to dominate at that level as well? Well, I love playing doubles. In my case, uh, it's helped me to be a s better singles player as well. And uh, it took me away from practice. I didn't have to like go out there and hit some practice balls. I think um, we actually only lately talked about it with my mom. And she's like, OK, what would you have changed maybe? You know, I said maybe not play as many doubles matches, but sometimes it's like it really helped my singles game, like coming in and see, have a real all-around game and uh, see the balls, you know, early enough and have good anticipation. So it really helped my uh, my singles as well. So it's hard, you know, sometimes it can wear you out for the singles, but on the other hand, it can help you too.